Hayden's looking at me like he, he might swing his hips to Elvis occasionally, do you? That was not the look that I was aiming for. I think you've it? drastically misinterpreted me there. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, Let, let's get on to uh, Midweek Media Watch. But before we begin, you want to give listeners something to think about during this segment. Yeah, I just, you know, bit of fun, end of the year. Six years ago, I made up a holiday media drinking game, which uh, I'll rebrand as a holiday media bingo for the RNZ audience, which I know is fastidiously sober and upstanding in all circumstances. But the premise is that every year around this time, uh, news organisations, their reporters go on holiday and they have to raid the cupboard for staple holiday stories to fill their column inches, their broadcast segments. And I've just noticed that every year around this time, pretty much the same 20 or 30 stock stories get repeated. It's every year without fail. So reliable holiday entries, they include stuff like the obvious reporting on a shark sighting, always got to have a shark sighting. But you also have stuff like every year you get the FPOS spending in the lead up to Christmas. Every year, for some reason, I think Correction sends out a release, you get what prisoners are eating for dinner. Uh, there's other ones, traffic jams at Walkworth and Coromandel, tents being washed out, you know... Uh, uh, these are my ones that I'm observing. I'm just asking you, if I've missed any there, that's quite an extensive list, but if I've missed any, please do send them through. What stories do you notice every year around the holidays when journalists are away and you have to fill the paper somehow? Okay, let's see if we can get a few more through. You can text us on 2101. Uh, stories that you hear every Christmas. But there's only tents being washed away and flooding if there's actual bad weather. There's always bad weather. <laughs> right. There's always a tent being washed away somewhere. <laughs> uh, you also wanted to use your last Midweek Media Watch to recap the big media stories of 2022 and also the questions that they throw up for next year. So what's first? Yeah, so it's a little bit similar to what Colin did on Sunday, but I'm putting my own spin on things. I think first is the first story, the first big story of the year, one that might have faded in our memories a little bit, but the occupation of Parliament and the size and vehemence uh, force of that occupation really had the media asking itself, what it could have done more to cover the growth of this protest movement and its potential to upset our democracy, really. like So there was this ongoing question as well of how to cover the protest without misinforming people, given that a lot of its core claims were based on misinformation. And have we arrived uh, at some solid answers to these dilemmas? Uh, I don't really think think so. I mean, I've personally gone back and forth on some of this stuff. And I, I mean, in general, and where I started out and where I think po probably I still am in some ways is that it's just best not to platform people that are spouting conspiracy theories in particular, because no matter how much you fact check or how responsibly you do it, you're still giving a huge platform to some pretty fringe ideas and you're still going to expose people to misinformation. They're busy. They're not necessarily going to be able to pass everything amazingly like a scientist would. You know, you're just going to give a platform to it. So, I mean, there, there's also the fact that just giving an extreme view and a very fringe view by its very nature um, a platform, if you give it a platform by its very nature, it's going to have a distorting effect. You're going to make that view seem more prominent and more mainstream than it really is. So that can happen with stuff like anti-vax views. I think, actually, I mean, the, the, the case in point the, is arguably never more evident than in our coverage of the parliament protest, where this loud, passionate, but actually relatively small group of people managed to hijack the nation's attention for weeks until even journalists started convincing themselves that these were this was a major political force uh, bursting into life here. Maybe so in the future, but the truth of the matter was probably revealed a little bit down the road when the local elections happened and Voices for Freedom stood some candidates and they didn't make much of a dent despite low turnout. So, yeah, it's not always possible to ignore these people. Parliament protest case in point. Uh, another way that people say we should cover them, truth sandwich, say the truth, then say their claim, then say the truth again. But another thing that comes up as well is something called pre-bunking, where you really try and furnish people with rigorously researched uh information on the issues of the day that are subject of conspiracy theories and make sure that they're forearmed, forewarned about what they're going to see out there when they go into the wilds of the internet and help avoid them being sucked down that rabbit hole. Well, who's actually doing this type of coverage well, if anybody? Someone that I'm not sure that 
he necessarily adheres to all of those principles or anything like that. But I just some, think someone that's coverage that has been excellent has been Stuff's Charlie Mitchell. And he's just done a really good job of doing investigative journalism, tracking some of the leading, leading figures in our conspiracy movements and their path down that rabbit hole. He's reported on stuff like the case of Baby W that we had recently, how that situation arose, Graham Phillips, the attempted saboteur and anti-vaxxer. And, and he does these kind of meticulous and dispassionate uh, uh long lengthy pieces on these people and in explaining their origins fully I think he robs them of a lot of their power and he's just been a really good reporter in this area Do you want to uh, switch back quickly to holiday media bingo? <laughs> yeah sure, <laughs> what, what have we got? Uh, Christmas gifts re-gifted Christmas gifts re-gifted <laughs> That's from Frank okay. Christmas injuries, ACC That's a great one Julie says uh, and there's always strong winds and a trampoline flying through the air, Emmett says. Oh, is there? <laughs> road toll. Yeah, road toll's a grim one. That is, that is, you know, I remember when I did it, you have to go in every morning and you update the holiday road toll. It's the grim task of the journalist. It's definitely, yeah, something that you have to do. Uh, another one that I just thought of, uh, presents being stolen from under the tree. doesn't happen every year, but when it does. Only a few more days left for that. Gosh, it gets blanket coverage. There's no, there's no better news story for Christmas. Tom, Terrible for the children. Of Tom course. says, "Hi, Hayden. Don't forget the Highland Games at Waipu and the real time road toll ticker. And uh, and what about the Primo year when we had a group of travellers causing chaos? Now that was a Juno's dream year. That was incredible. <laughs> right, the tourists from hell. <laughs> yes, that's another one, isn't it? They went to the Indian place down the road from me and." caused havoc there. So, I mean, that one really hit close to home for me. Right. I had another of the biggest media stories this year was the rise in ram raids and that accompanying tough justice narrative. Yeah, I think it was interesting because for a long time leading up to this year, we had this kind of growing media consensus around the idea that just doling out the most harsh possible punishments isn't actually necessarily particularly helpful. And that shift was partly down to the work of people like the former National MP Chester Burroughs. And he consistently pointed to evidence that jail is actually kind of a breeding ground for crime. And he pushed for a more rehabilitative approach to justice and I'd say that that consensus has definitely been eroded a bit this year with the huge spike in ram raids that started early in the year and carried on in earnest particularly through winter and it prompted a barrage of headlines about a crime wave and a huge and and, and there was accompanying that this huge rise in kind of lock them up rhetoric that had been largely absent from the media from the media for a little bit of time and you had a lot of commentators asserting ad nauseum that uh, you know these criminals are offending because they don't fear the consequences of their actions. But there, there's some backing for that narrative, though, isn't there? Particularly ram raids. Yeah, it, it's there is. Uh, it's possibly a bit more nuanced, nuanced than the coverage gives it credit for. So yeah, ram raids in particular, they've risen a huge amount. Uh, but there are other facts, you know, that's the truth that this is based on. There's this really violent and confronting type of crime that is on the rise and people are feeling frightened. There are other facts that don't really match the narrative. So Emma Vitz at the the spin-off, she measured crime rate rates and found that they'd gone up a small amount, but they remain substantially lower than they were in 2016, for instance, and even... There was reporting that youth crime went down in the year leading up to June 30, which included some of that period where ram raids were most prevalent. Uh, so, yeah, a little bit of nuance in the discussion there. Actually, as well, Emma Vitz found that not all the crime was rising in Auckland, for instance. It was sort of, I think she highlighted that there was more of a rise in Nelson or something like that, which isn't exactly known as a crime hotspot. Anyway, this hasn't stopped the commentariat decrying our lawless youth and our out-of-control crime, crime wave. And I think their position was really encapsulated best by... Ryan Bridge on the AM show, sorry, just AM, and this is what he said. Take some responsibility. There is a spike in crime. Talk to any normal person on the street and they will tell you they are more scared now than they have probably been in their grown lives about crime in New yeah. Zealand. And that's not just because it's in our heads. Don't tell us it's in our heads and, point to, and point to a graph. It's offensive. 
Yeah, I mean, maybe it's offensive. Maybe it's in people's heads because it's in our media coverage. And I mean, it's well documented that people's perceptions of crime are often out of step with reality. I'm sorry, that's just a fact. That's just been that's been studied quite <laughs> quite extensively. And people's perceptions of crime are influenced by narratives being advanced by people in the media, like, for instance, breakfast TV hosts. So ram raids, they're a particularly violent and brazenly lawless type of crime, and that leaves people feeling more unsettled than a non-violent robbery or white-collar fraud or something like that. It also generates headlines. And uh, I think those headlines as well are a big factor in people feeling scared. But, uh, I mean... It, they're fair enough in a way because this is quite a confronting type of crime but the blaring about a crime wave can distort the true picture you know they might say crime wave in reality there's actually just a minor crime swell it was not like this was the only media narrative running though Hayden in fact um, others ha- others have been showing different perspectives haven't they yeah for sure and I want to highlight them into 2022 there was uh, the former police detective Tim McKinnell he did a documentary for TV and crime need versus greed that put the spotlight on a crime wave that doesn't necessarily get the same amount of media attention and that's white collar dishonesty fraud. crimes like robbery and burglary are on the slow decline while fraud and deception aided by technology have overtaken everything else while society and the media fixate on gang crimes ram raids and other forms of street crime white collar criminals have been robbing us blind so that's that's Tim McKinnell there, and that's backed by a whole bunch of reporting and factual information in the actual documentary about how pervasive white-collar crime really is. So, yeah, ram raids are a big story. They inflict fear and financial pain on people like dairy owners who aren't exactly rolling in riches to begin with. Uh, but I think McConnell's documentary raises some questions for us in 2023. Are we letting these richer, more well-heeled criminals get away comparatively scot-free and focusing on a group of criminals that are, for the most part, coming from desperate or abusive situations? So another Juno who actually you know, went into some of those desperate and abusive situations and talked about them and tried to inject a bit of nuance into the discussion was TVNZ's John Campbell. He went to, to Oriri Atetonga, that's an Oranga Tamariki uh, youth justice residence, to talk to two teenagers who had carried out ram raids. And the whole thing, I think, is worth reading on the One News website. But uh, i just quote one notable section. It's kind of a rebuke to some of the tough-on-crime rhetoric, I think. And he, he just says, Those of us who argue tough love is, is the solution to their criminality may be underestimating the extent to which they've had the tough already. It's the love that they've been so desperately short of. Do you reckon the media shouldn't be covering ram raids? No, and I don't want you, I don't want you to take that point away from what I'm saying here. Absolutely legitimate story, uh, concerning story. It's just that it would be great if we had a bit more of that context and the coverage and a bit more of the nuance that people like Campbell and McKinnell are serving up. Well, if we're talking about the big issues for 2023, there's an election coming up, and uh, that always presents uh, both an opportunity and a challenge for the media, Hayden. Uh, wh- what are you hoping to see in the coverage of the campaign? Oh, I, I don't have time to talk about everything that I'd love to see in the coverage of the campaign, but one of our well-worn criticisms on Media Watch, and I think, I think it's, I mean, I'm a little biased, but I think it's a legitimate one, uh, it's that modern political reporting... Uh, often issues value judgments or genuine analysis of what policies will mean for real people in favour of focusing on the horse race elements of it and, you know, what it will mean for winning the election and who will take power. So, uh, you know, a classic of this genre of political reporting, horse race journalism as it's called, is the policy might not have a lot of evidence behind it, but there's no denying it's good politics. That's the phrase that you'd use. Maybe you can see that a little bit in the reporting on something like Nationals proposed boot camps for young offenders, which don't have a lot of evidential backing. I think the ones that the key government implemented had an 87% reoffending rate or something like that. Uh, but you do have a lot of support from the public. In fairness to our media, though, I think it's actually been pretty good at fact-checking these kinds of things. I only know that figure because the media did report it. And, I mean, they've been putting the heat on policies a bit in recent times. That can change in the lead-up to an election when the pressure really goes on to not appear 
to be biased, to appear to be objective. And there's this pressure to be quote unquote objective that sometimes stops people from really criticizing and analyzing policies in detail. And I just hope that maybe the media, you know, keeps the prerogative, keeps their prerogative to provide that kind of analysis. They provide genuine critical assessment of our politicians' promises, even if it puts them at risk. Even if one party's policies and promises are dumber than the other parties or one party's are smarter than the others or whatever, you know, even if, say that if it's the case, you know, don't worry about being called biased. Try and actually cover what is going to work and actually talk about how it's going to impact on people's lives. Yeah, I totally agree, but um, it's not the thing that actually gets the clickbait, is it? <laughs> no, and that's, I, I don't know. That's a kind of chicken or egg thing, right? Are we interested in the just the cut and thrust and the, the, the power, who's going to seize power stuff because that's what we're served or... Um, uh, <laughs> are we served it because that's what we're interested in? I think it's probably a mixture of both of those, to be honest. It's 27 minutes to 11, Midweek Media Watch with Hayden Donnell. Uh, and I, I wanted to just um, fast track through your awards. You've got personal non-RNZ approved awards for us the, uh, this year, Hayden. I do. I've written some. <laughs> it's a worst of and best of list. This is a vehicle for transmitting the information. So... Oh, I always love a good worst of and best of. the. Let's start with the worst media performance of 2022. Great, great we got to use that sting. So happy that you loaded that into the system. This must really take you back to your TV presenting days. These, are the, a, these are the awards. Never had a drum roll there. <laughs> now, uh, I, I, didn't you really? Oh, oh my gosh. Well, what an experience this has been. I mean, I've widened this out to media personalities, people appearing in the media. So not just journalists. I'm not just picking on journalists. And I hasten to say this isn't exhaustive. You know, I've got a three-year-old and a one-year-old at home, so my memory isn't functioning at a high level. This is what I came up with, though. So nominees. You've gone, you've gone for nominees. Okay, so there's no winners or losers, really. Not here. just yet. We're just going with oh, nominees. nominees. Okay, for the worst media performance, number one. Willie Jackson may have single-handedly killed the RNZ TVNZ merger in one Q&A interview. Uh, the merger has been looking like it's on shaky grounds after he was interviewed by uh, Jack Tame just a few weeks ago, and the interview contained a bunch of jazz where Jackson admonished Tame for doing what he called a negative interview. Uh, critics of the merger called it a train wreck. They accused Jackson of compromising TVNZ's editorial independence. Look. I, th I think that's just a little bit much, maybe. Like, I, l I listened to it, and it was quite clear that Willie Jackson was kind of joking around with Tame, and they have this kind of prior relationship. But it was pretty ill-advised and seemed for a time to have put the skids on the government's plans with Jacinda Ardern sort of hinting that maybe she wouldn't see it as a priority in the coming year. Though I will note that on, on Takaradi this morning, she was more committed to it, saying that it was a necessary move. And the second nominee for the worst media performance of 2022. This uh, memorably cruel segment from Heather Duplessy Allen. When was the last time you were on a plane? Mm, I'm not sure. Maybe a few months ago, to be honest. Where'd you go? Fiji. Izzy! <laughs> Izzy! Don't you care about the climate, Izzy? Of course I care about the climate. Not enough. You went to... <laughs> you went to Fiji. <laughs> Izzy, come on, mate. Are you, are you serious? <laughs> Uh, that was Heather Duplessy Allen. She was talking to the 16-year-old climate activist, Izzy Cook, who had gone to Fiji uh, in defiance of her principles. But... Uh, to be fair, she is a teenager. She was taken there by her parents, and actually her parents, or her mum, wrote something for the spin-off a bit later, explaining that and uh, kind of accusing Duplessis Allen of bullying her daughter, and there were multiple complaints made to the BSA over that segment. Mm, I was uh, laughing at the maniacal laughter itself. Uh, Hamish Pinkham comes in at number three, the Rhythm and Vines director. Yeah, what, what got him on the list? One of the most stomach-churning quotes of the year, to be honest. So he received some criticism for Rhythm and Vines booking Dizzy Rascal for the festival following the artist's conviction for assaulting his partner and asked, you know, by a journalist, Pinkham was asked by a journalist why he booked him, and he said, as we say, he's done the crime, done the time, and now it's time to do the grime. 
So, I mean, that raises a lot of questions for me. I mean, as we say, who exactly is we here? Because that's not that's not a common saying. That's not like the early bird gets the worm, you know. And and I, I assume that the we is quite a small group of people that may include just Pinkham and a few others. Uh, I I think as well, you know, something like the early bird gets the worm, that's a useful saying. It's got a lesson in it, while this one is just kind of slightly revolting. So I don't think it's a good saying. I, I really disliked it as a quote. And uh, number four on the worst media performance, not in any order. This is not in any order. This is all just nominees. Look, Rachel Smalley provided. Uh, this is not a major. It was just one of the more head scratching solutions to the ram raid spike. And so this is what she said: How can we? How can they somehow manage to keep their identities hidden behind these oversized hoodies and masks? And it's probably look. It's probably not the most foolproof idea I've ever had as such, but I thought about a really simple short-term measure. Why don't we ban, for the short term, hoodies and malls? Uh, What? uh, Correct about it not being the most foolproof idea. Look, the thing... (laughs) The thing with banning, I mean, actually, I was told today that some malls actually do ban teenagers having hoods over their heads in malls. So, you know, not completely outlandish there. A few issues, right? Hoodies are sold in malls. So what are we going to do? Are we going to ban the stores that sell hoodies from malls? How deep does this rabbit hole go? The other thing is that if you're doing ram raids, right, uh, I hate to say this, but ram raids are already illegal, and that's not stopping them. So do you think that maybe... If you're coming in with your car, you're about to ram raid the store and you're like, oh, no, wait a second, hoodie ban in place. I'll go down the road instead, maybe (laughs) get my life back on track. I just don't think that that's necessarily going to stop them. I mean, this is just what I'm thinking. I'm doing a bit of commentary here. Uh, Not the most major one. Just didn't think it was a great idea. Okay, you've got a trio for your number five yeah, uh, fifth nomination. Well, three of Farmax PR people uh, who seem to have or were accused of lying to Today FM about whether the agency was about to fund the drug Trikafta, which treats cystic fibrosis. And so, uh, one of today's hosts, Lloyd Burr, uh, had actually a story from Rachel Smalley, who's really connected in this space and had really good sources, standing up the fact that Pharmac was about to fund Trikafta and he just wanted to, before she went on air on his show, she wanted he wanted to check that her facts was, were correct with Pharmac. He rang one PR person. They told him, absolutely not, we're not about to, to fund it. The next one apparently told him uh, that he would be breaking the hearts of all cystic fibrosis sufferers. They told him that absolutely wasn't going to happen. A third external comms person also said, don't run the story, it's not right. Uh, it was right. Pharmac announced its decision to fund Trikafta two days later. Uh, and it seems that Pharmac wanted to keep its carefully laid media plans in place for the announcement of uh, this drug funding. And they were going to great lengths to preserve... Uh, the sanctity of that announcement rather than actually necessarily telling a journalist the truth. And number six, a journalist asked a question of Uh, two women. This famous question. Yeah, a lot of people will be wondering, are you two meeting just because, you know, you're similar in age and, you know, got a lot of, you know, common stuff there, you know, when you got into politics and stuff, or can Kiwis actually expect to see more deals so between cool. our two countries down the line because my there first, is I mean, my first question is I wonder whether or not anyone ever asked Barack Obama and John Key if they met because they mm. were of similar age. That was a news talk ZB journalist asking a question to Jacinda Ardern, the Finnish Prime Minister Hannah Marin. So suffice to say that question was not met with unanimous praise and was in fact heartily criticized and mocked around the world. It went global. It went viral globally, probably because of that articulate answer from Jacinda Ardern and also Sana Marin. Uh, not one of our proudest international moments in the media. And we're sticking with uh, Heather Plissy Allen. Yeah, well, not really. She was just peripherally involved in this one. This was, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she was just the platform for this one. It was News Talk ZB's oh, Jason Walls. Oh, hang on. Before we go there, have we been there yet? 
Has she been? Oh yes, she's been on with the bullying of the of. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, we have okay. done. We did it. We did it earlier. All right, Don't she's worry. in twice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Jason Walls criticised actually on her show. Ah, all right. Twenty thousand dollars in film commission funding given to the documentary Susie and the Virus, and the Herald echoed the snarky tone of that segment, asking in its lead sentence of its story, "Would you pay twenty thousand dollars for a documentary about science superhero Dr. Susie Wiles? Because you already did." Uh, now, a few problems with some of that reporting. Susie and the Virus hadn't actually received $20,000 in film commissioning funding. It was part of the Loading Docs program. It had only received $6,000 in production finance. Uh, furthermore, the film was actually launched on the NZME website in 2020. NZME is the owner of Newstalk ZB and the Herald. Uh, uh, sorry, the NZME website. It was launched on the Herald website, to be honest. And as it turns out... Uh, Thirdly, NZME itself has received far more funding for its own video projects from the government in recent times than that $20,000 or $6,000 of what it actually was. So uh, not a great uh, instalment all round, and the Media Council actually found that uh, the paper or NZME's response to that was insufficient. And number eight, there's a lot of nom- nominees here, Hayden. I've number- got a lot. It's <laughs> Bus- a whole year. Business NZ get a nomination. I'll just be quick on this one. Business NZ, they, they, um, their campaign against fair pay agreements was uh, pretty vociferous and kind of pushed the boundaries of the truth at times. And so one thing that they did was actually rewrite the headline on a UN document uh, to say that uh, the fair pay agreements legislation had been put on a worst case list of labour law breaches. Now, that wasn't actually the headline. It was far more benign than that. And the UN didn't find that we were on the worst case list in the, at all. Uh, but the uh, the organisation, Business NZ, still got the Herald to run with their misrepresentation and their misrepresented headlines. So that was one of the uh, uh, less... Uh, Less oh, scrupulous. I don't know what what word to use about this one. Uh, uh, media instalments this year. Melanie reads in at number nine. No, well, just uh, nine. Just nine. <laughs> just not. <laughs> not. Uh, she visited Freedom Village, that pro- that Parliament protest at the beginning of the year, and she mainly focused on the leaders of Voices for Freedom. Uh, they're going to feature a little bit later on, uh, but this is how she introduced them. You guys started it, yeah? yeah the three yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah. Three mums. Three mums. Voices for Freedom is one of the key players at the protest. Claire Deeks, Alia Brand and Libby Johnson. Now that's that's not really just three mums. They're actually one of the most more prominent conspiracy groups in the country. And just last but not least, uh, tenth one, Mia Wayne Brown caught on camera saying this about Herald journalist Simon Wilson. He's been at me for all year long. And the first thing I do when I get to be the mayor I'll be, they'll be gluing little pictures of him on all the urinals so we can pee on him. <laughs> it's very strange uh, first thing to do when you're elected mayor, but it didn't, uh, apparently that's, uh, you know, it didn't hurt his electoral chances. He actually won the mayoralty soon after that, but still not a great proud moment for it in our, in our media this year. Okay, well, uh, it was a misplaced drum roll, really, because it should be where the winner is. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you reckon? And the, and the winner is... Farmax PR team, I, th- I think I just wanted to put them here because I think I underplayed this when the story came out, but alleged, totally misrepresenting the story to a journalist as a PR person, it's a really big no-no, especially in order to preserve the sanctity of your planned media release. Uh, I think it's kind of resignation material, to be honest. I, w- I wasn't very impressed by this at all. All right, we've got a legacy award. Yeah, Miki Ngārangi Forbes and Annabelle Lee Mather. I thought that it's just worth saying they're stepping down from the hui after seven years as presenter and producer, respectively. They've done great work. I think Forbes' interviewing style, I'm a massive fan of that. Other interviewers, you know, maybe you, Karen, no, that's not true. Uh, maybe Corin Dan. They'll kind of maybe harangue people into into giving up information, but she uses this kind of pointed silence, which almost works better, makes shifts the shifts, shifts the comfort levels in the room. And I think her approach is really effective. She'll be missed. And, uh, well, we've had the worst. Do we get the best? Yeah, do we have time for the best? Maybe. If you rattle through them, yep. I'll rattle through them. Uh, so best, all the media who covered the Queen's death, admirable stuff, and that nothing happened for 10 days and they still had to provide blanket coverage. I thought the, the company that did it the best, News Hub, uh, amazing stuff. They really uh, 
They danced. You know, it's like Paul Holmes and the Ingham twins when they weren't saying anything to him in that famous interview. They had the same thing, just basically nothing was happening. Death is one of those states where famously not much is going on. And Patrick Gower would do stuff like charge into an English field to find the shop where Prince Charles got his mittens from. And during this period as well, the lifestyle editor at News Hub's website, Lana Anderlane, coined what I thought was an incredibly memorable term. She called uh, Prince Charles's... Well, King Charles's, sorry, uh, Swollen Hands, Girthy Grippers. I thought that was incredibly memorable. Uh, Stuff's Fire and Fury. Uh, that's by Stuff Circuit. Uh, they delved into the conspiracy movement in New Zealand. They got a called out for deciding not to platform some of the principal figures in their documentary. They were actually justified in their decision to do that by the media council, and actually the documentary itself was really good. Uh, as much as I hate to admit it, number three, my friend David Farrier, probably deserves some credit for his work on the abusive practices at the Arise Megachurch, which is pretty much no more as a result. Uh, you know, it's substantially changed as a result of that reporting. Uh, I think TVNZ deserves credit. They drove a comeback for feature-length documentaries in prime time. I mentioned Need vs. Greed earlier, but I thought the best one this year was No Māori Allowed, which was about the history of Puka Kohi, and it was, a, it was just a really beautiful documentary. I'd urge you to seek it out. I'm I'm keeping on going. <laughs> the aforementioned Charlie Mitson, number yes. five, Mitchell. Uh, he wrote uh, amazing stuff in a range of things, but especially on those people going down the rabbit hole. Uh, John Campbell, he quietly churned out a range of great journalism this year. Uh, I love this one, number seven. News Hub's Kaylee Callahan, one of the most difficult jobs in New Zealand. He gets sent out into the worst weather, the biggest storms, the worst cyclones, and he has to test just how terrible the weather is for the for the nation, uh, for the audiences of New Zealand. And this year he had another big year. There's lots of photos of him, you know, sopping wet, looking miserable in the cold. He headed to the west coast to get flooded out, to receive a severe lashing from the storm gods. And I really look forward to seeing what horrors unfold for him in 2023. <laughs> um <laughs> Nine, uh, uh, eight, Stuff's Kirsty Johnston. She just uh, has done Voyager award-winning work on family violence, but she took a break from that to break one of the biggest political stories of the year about Nationals Tauranga MP Sam Uffendale and his uh, the fact that he beat a fellow student during his school days. I thought Simon Wilson as well, magnanimous, about the mayor who threatened to stick pictures of him to the urinals. He actually wrote a column recently uh, listing reasons to love Wayne Brown ahead of Christmas. So that's really, you know... That's really the Christmas spirit there. Joy to the world. Um, well, deck the halls with boughs of holly. <laughs> Simon Wilson has written oh. nice things about Wayne Brown. So you've got nine in the best media performances of 2022. Is there a winner? Uh, winner. Should we do it? Drum roll. All these journalists are great work, but it has to go to Girthy Grippers. You know, th th their journalism will be remembered for years to come, but Girthy Grippers will go down in history. So I just think that that's a great phrase. Lana and Delane, uh, she wins. <laughs> There's a text here. Jessica says, Hayden, is there an honourable mention for every guy in Espinar versus Christopher Luxon interview on Morning Report? Oh, that's great. I should have, you know, there's... Uh, there's things that I've forgotten and things that I've omitted. Uh, Guyan would, Guyan's a great interviewer in general. He's, he did a lot of great interviews, and he did a lot of great documentaries this year. And uh, as well as conspiracy stories, Charlie Mitchell of Stuff This Person Agrees With You has done excellent stories on urban water and the environment. For example, Lake Onslow, he does high-quality investigative mahi. Bring on more journalists like him. Absolutely. I was going to mention Lake Onslow. All right, so the Christmas holiday media bingo, where we've had quite a lot of entries. You got any more to add? Uh, oh, what, have, what have I not said already? Uh, <laughs> December is the hottest on record, January is the hottest on record, and February is the hottest on record. That's a little joke about climate change. Uh, what, have the, what have the audience got? Uh, Rosalind, another repeated news story, the number of unwanted presents being listed on Trade Me on Boxing Day. Oh, what about kittens? <laughs> Are kittens always like unwanted pets from Christmas? They're always there, aren't they? Yeah, there's going to be mm. plenty of it, Hayden. Hey, well, thank you very much for that and uh, for all your work this year. Most appreciated and have a good Christmas. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me on the show all these, all these times. We'll see you back uh, end of Jan or early Feb. Probably early Feb. All right then. Have a great Christmas and New Year. You too.